This is a concavity and a second derivative test. You can find more uh, links to math and computer science YouTube videos under mathheels.com. So let's look at our uh, first problem here. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. We got f of x is equal to five six x to the third minus x squared plus three x minus one. Try to get on that one. And we're trying to, the instructions here say, determine open intervals in which the graph is concave uh, upward or concave downward. You know, does the graph open up or open down? Um, what that might look like is, you know, your graph is got going like that and it's kind of opening up. Or it's going like this and it's kind of kind of opening down. So that's what they're referring to. <coughs> So finding intervals of concavity. Now step one is to find our second derivative. That's sometimes a challenging step. So for our first derivative, take a power, put it out in front. So we got 5, 6 times 3x, and then lower our power by 1, minus uh, the x squared. Take our power, put it out in front, lower it by 1. 3x just becomes 3. <coughs> so that gives us, some. Um, let's see, 5 halves x squared minus 2x plus 3 for our first derivative. Now for our second derivative. Again, we'll take our power, put it out in front. So we've got 5 halves times 2x minus, and 2x becomes just 2, and then 3 goes to 0. 2's cancel, and we've got 5x minus 2. And that's our second derivative. <coughs> Step 2. Set this equal to zero and solve. So set this equal to zero and solve. So we got uh, 5x minus 2 equal to zero. We'll see we handle it a little bit differently um, when we got a fraction. We have to set our top of our fraction numerator and the bottom of the fraction the denominator equal to zero. So in this one, take the negative 2 over, becomes a positive 2, and I'll divide both sides by 5. And we get x is equal to 2 fifths. Now this right here, values we find are critical numbers. All that's saying is there's something potentially happening at that point. It's not saying for sure there is. Step three, using the critical numbers, build a table of intervals pick test cases plug them into the second derivative and determine the answer. <coughs> and determine answer. Well, we only got one critical number here. 
So we got x is equal to 2 fifths. And for our intervals uh, here, here is negative infinity. And clear over here is positive infinity. Now I'll pick test cases. It doesn't matter what you pick. Um, I just want to choose a number between negative infinity and two fifths. Zero is almost a perfect one to pick, whenever you can. And I want to choose one greater than two fifths, but less than infinity, uh, like one. Now those we want to take and plug into our second derivative. Remember our second derivative was right up here, the 5x minus 2. So we're going to plug those into 5x minus 2. <coughs> so we got 5 times 0 minus 2. And all we really care about is the sign. Uh, so 5 times 0 is 0, minus 2 is negative. Now in this one, we plug the 1 in. 5 times 1 is 5, minus 2 is 3, which is positive. Again, we could care less what the value is. All we really uh, care about is what the sign is, whether it's positive or negative. <coughs> so note, um, if the sign is negative, that means it's concave up. What am I doing? Concave down. If the sign is positive, that means it's concave up. So since this one is negative, that means it's concave down. Since with this one's positive, that means it's concave up. So our answer then is it's concave down from negative infinity to two fifths. Just looking at the uh, interval here, and then it's concave up from two fifths to infinity. And those would be our answers. <coughs> Save this page, concavity in the second derivative test. And let's look at our next problem. At f of x is equal to x squared minus 4 over 3x minus 1. Same instructions. Find out the uh, intervals in which it's concave upward, concave downward. I'm going to grab a drink here. Well, let's find our first derivative. This is step one, find our find our second derivative. But the first thing we do, do is find our first derivative. This is the quotient rule. Top part will be P, the bottom part will be Q. P prime, the derivative of x squared minus 4, is going to be 2x. Q prime, the derivative of 3x minus 1, is 3. <coughs> our formula for the quotient rule is P prime Q minus P Q prime all over Q squared. So for our first derivative, p prime was 2x times q, which is 3x minus 1, minus p, which was x squared minus 4, times q prime, which is 3, all over q squared. Let me double check that. Okay. Now if I look at my first group, um, this 2x... 3x minus 1, and look at my second group, the x squared minus 4, 3. They don't have anything in common. There's no GCF. 
So we're just going to get rid of parentheses. Come out of like terms. See where it heads. Heads to. 2x times 3x gives us 6x squared. 2x times negative 1 is negative 2x. And uh, we have the negative here with the 3, so that's like negative 3. Negative 3 times x squared is negative 3x squared. And negative 3 times negative 4 gives us a positive 12. All over 3x minus 1 squared. Combine to get like term, 6x squared minus 3x squared is 3x squared minus 2x plus 12 over 3x minus 1 squared. <coughs> and that's our first derivative. Well, now we need to find our second derivative. Uh, use quotient rule again. Uh, top part here is p, bottom part is q. P prime, the derivative of 3x squared minus 2x plus 12 is 6x minus 2. Q prime, derivative of 3x minus 1 squared, uh, we got parentheses to a power, so we'll take our power, put it out in front, what's inside of parentheses remains as is, lower a power by 1 times the derivative of what's inside the parentheses. Well, the derivative of 3x minus 1 is 3, so uh, we got 2 times 3x minus 1 times 3. <coughs> which gives us 2 times 3 is 6 times 3x minus 1. Now I'll leave the 6 out in front there. And sometimes you'll find, uh, like on p prime, see how they both are divisible by 2? I can factor a 2 out. Sometimes that's beneficial, sometimes not. Uh, in this particular problem, it um, we can factor it out. It doesn't benefit us a whole lot. Um, let me go ahead and factor it out here. So take 2 out, and that gives us 3. Ooh, I lie. These both have 3x minus 1, don't they? That's kind of weird. Um, 6x minus 2, yeah, 2, yeah. I wasn't expecting that, but... Okay, so now, come up here to find my second derivative. Again, I'm going to use my p prime q minus p q prime over q squared. So for our second derivative, p prime was um, 2 times 3x minus 1 times q, which was 3x minus 2 squared, or 3x minus 1 squared, sorry minus p, <coughs> and p is um, 3x squared minus 2x plus 12, times q prime, which is uh, 6 times 3x minus 1, all over q squared. So we're going to have uh, 3x minus 1 squared raised to the second power. Uh, double check that. P prime Q minus P Q prime. Okay. Well, looking up on top at our first group and our second group, this is our first group. And the reason why is because everything's multiplication. And this is our second group. Everything's multiplication. We got this times this times this. And we got this times this times this. Well, the 2 and 6, I can factor 2 out. And they both have a 3x minus 1. So I can factor that out. Now that 2 is gone, that 3x minus 1 is gone, and I'm left with 3x minus 1 squared. Minus, that 3x minus 1 is gone, 6 divided by 2 is 3, and then we're left with the 3x squared minus 2x plus 12. All over 3x minus 1 to the 4th power. When you're raising one exponent to another exponent, you multiply the exponents, so 2 times 2 gives you the 4. Now notice this 3x minus 1 here will cancel with one of these 3x minus 1's. So we've got 2 times, and there's nothing else I can factor out here, so what I'm going to do is get rid of parentheses, combine to get like terms, see where it heads. 3x minus 1 squared is 3x minus 1 times 3x minus 1. Negative 3 times 3x squared is negative 9x squared. Negative 3 times negative 2x is positive 6x. 
Negative 3 times 12 gives us negative 36. And this is 3x minus 1 to the third power. Because again, that one of those canceled away with this 3x minus 1 here. <coughs> okay, so multiply everything together here. 3x times 3x is 9x squared. 3x times negative 1 is negative 3x. Negative 1 times 3x is negative 3x. Negative 1 times negative 1 is a positive 1. Minus 9x squared plus 6x minus 36. And then 3x minus 1 to the third down here. And uh, combine together like terms. Here's a 9x squared minus 9x squared. Those cancel. Here's a negative 3x, negative 3x, and a positive 6x. Those cancel. And we got 1 minus 36, which is negative 35, over 3x minus 1 to the third, which gives us negative 70 over 3x minus 1 to the third. Well, that was step one. That's our second derivative. Now, step two. Set your top part equal to zero. So, we'll set negative 70 equal to zero and set your bottom part equal to zero. And this will give us our critical numbers. Now, negative 70 equal to zero, there's no variable to solve for there. So, we can cross that out. You actually never need to set a number equal to zero. It doesn't go anywhere. And I'll set this equal to zero. Now, whenever you have parentheses to a power equal to zero, you can always drop the power and set what's inside the parentheses equal to zero. So we've got 3x minus 1 equal to zero. Take the negative 1 over, it becomes a positive 1, divide both sides by 3, and we get x is equal to 1 third. <coughs> Step 3, build a table of intervals. Here's 1 third clear over here is negative infinity clear over here is positive infinity and I would choose test cases something between negative infinity and one-third like zero doesn't matter what you pick as long as it's between those numbers and something between one-third and infinity like one or two or something like that so choose one now we want to plug those into our second derivative which is right here and all we care about is a sign now the top part is a negative 70, so the top part is always negative. We don't even need to worry about the top part. We know what that's going to be. We just need to plug it into the bottom part. So we've got 3x minus 1 to the third. So 3x minus 1 to the third. Now if I put 0 in there, 3 times 0 is 0, minus 1 is a negative 1. Negative 1 to the third is negative. Negative divided by negative is positive, which... Um, means this is concave up. Now if I plug 1 in, 3 times 1 is 3, minus 1 is 2, 2 to the third is uh, positive, so negative divided by positive is negative. So this is concave down. So our answer is it's going to be concave up from negative infinity to 1 third, and then concave down from 1 third to positive infinity. And that's our answer. Now let's um let's take a look at the graph um, of our original function. If I graph this, uh, put in TA3, TA4, the key to it is put parentheses around top, parentheses around the bottom. Anytime you have more than a single variable, a single number on top or bottom, you have to put parentheses around it. And I guess I thought I had my calculator up and running. I guess not. Okay, so I'm press Y equals. Clear. And I got uh, beginning parentheses X squared minus 4. Closing parentheses divided by beginning parentheses 3X minus 1. closing parentheses, and then graph. Okay, one-third. One-third is about right here. And if I look to the left of it, it does look like it's concave up.
which is what I said here. I said it's concave up from negative infinity to one-third. And then from one-third, which is about right here, to the right, it does look like it's concave down. Um, so a lot of times you can look at your graph and see whether you got the right answer. Now, you may not know where you went wrong, but you can definitely see if, you, if it matches. Again, concave up means the graph is uh, opening up. Concave down means it's opening it down. Excuse me. So let me save that. Let's take a look at our next problem. <coughs> and uh, I got f of x equals x plus 1 over cosine x. I didn't put it on this problem, but I did mean for it to be between uh, 0 and... Um, not including 2 pi. Just in case. A lot of times when you have cosine and sine in your problem, does a little loopity loop thing over and over, so it's uh, infinite places where it uh, changes concavity. Okay, same instructions, I think. Uh, determine open intervals in which graph is concave upward or concave downward. So, uh, first step. We need to find our second derivative. Well, first off, let's rewrite this. Uh, f of x is equal to x plus, and I could rewrite this as cosine x to the negative 1 power. Because uh, I could rewrite this as cosine x to the first power, and then I take it up to the numerator, take it up on top, and the sine of the exponent changes. Uh, I do this so I don't have to use a quotient rule. I can just use the uh, chain rule, general power rule specifically. So for our first derivative, derivative of x is 1. Now here we got parentheses to a power. So I take my power, put it out in front. What's inside the parentheses remains as is. Lower my power by 1. So negative 1 minus 1 gives me a negative 2. And then I multiply it times the derivative of what's inside the parentheses. So we got 1 uh, minus cosine x to the negative 2 times, and the derivative of cosine is a uh, negative sign. So I got negative negative. That's going to give me a positive. And um, so we got 1 plus, and I'll put the sign here, and I'll go ahead and take that cosine x as negative 2 power down to the denominator. It becomes cosine x to the positive 2. Now, there's different ways you could do this. I could have left it in this form and just used the product rule. Um, or you could rewrite it this way and use the um, quotient rule. Or you could use your properties, your identities of trig, to rewrite this. Uh, sine over cosine is tangent, and then 1 over cosine is secant. So you could rewrite as tangent secant and take derivative from there. It's kind of up to you. Um, I'm going to use the quotient rule. So the top part is our P, and the bottom part is our Q. P prime, the derivative of a sine is cosine. And for Q prime, here we have parentheses to a power. So again, take a power, put it out in front. What's inside the parentheses remains as is. Lower your power by 1, and then you multiply it times the derivative of what's inside the parentheses. So that gives us 2 cosine x, and derivative of cosine is negative sine. So that gives us negative 2 cosine x sine x. Okay, so now we're ready to do our second derivative. Um, let's do it up here. So formula p prime q minus p q prime over q squared. So for second derivative, we got p prime, which was cosine x, times q, which was uh, cosine squared, 
minus p, which was sine x. By the way, the derivative of 1 is 0. That drops away. Times q prime, which was um, negative 2 cosine x sine x. All over q squared. Um, q was cosine squared. So we're going to have um, cosine x to the second power raised to the second power. Now let me double check all that. Uh, p prime times q minus p times q prime. Well, cosine times um, uh, cosine squared gives me cosine of the third. Negative times a negative is positive. And we got 2. And then we got uh, cosine. And sine times sine is sine squared. All over. Um, when you're raising one power to another power, you multiply the exponents. 2 times 2 is 4, so this is cosine of the fourth. <coughs> now, I notice up on top they have a cosine in, in common, so I'll factor it out. And that leaves me cosine squared plus um, 2 sine squared. <coughs> Excuse me. Over cosine of the fourth. Now we have a cosine here, and we have a cosine of the fourth here, so they're going to cancel. That will cosine will cancel with one of these cosines, and we end up with cosine squared plus 2 sine squared all over cosine to the third, and that's our second derivative. Now we need to do step two. here. Continuing on. Step two, we need to find our um, critical numbers. So we set our top part equal to zero. So we've got cosine squared plus two sine squared equal to zero. And we set our bottom part equal to zero. Now on uh, this first one here, um, in order to solve this, um, it's easiest to get everything in terms of the same trig function. Well, the um, doesn't matter which one you pick. I'll choose the uh, cosine squared to work with. So I'll rewrite the cosine squared as 1 minus sine squared. Plus 2 sine squared equal to 0. Now negative sine squared plus 2 sine squared gives me a plus sine squared equal to 0. Take the negative 1 to the right side, so we get sine squared is equal to negative 1. Now, here we have something squared equal to the other side, so we'll drop our squared and set it equal to plus or minus square root of the other side. Um, problem with this is, is um, negative 1 gives us an i, and sine is never equal to an i, so this one doesn't actually give us any critical numbers. This one over here. Uh, Any time you have something to a power, uh, like brackets to a power, or parentheses to a power, and you got zero on the side, you can always just set what's inside the bracket or inside the parentheses equal to zero. So set cosine equal to zero. Now if I look around in my unit circle, where cosine is equal to zero, here at pi over two, we got uh, zero, uh, one, and at... Uh, 3 pi over 2. We have 0, negative 1. Remember, cosine on your unit circle is your x uh, part. So we see that uh, x is equal to pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. So those are our two critical numbers. <coughs> Step 3. Build a table of intervals. Well, clear over here is x is equal to 0. That's where it starts at. My next one is x is equal to pi over 2. Next one is 3 pi over 2. And then uh, this one ends at 2 pi. Because remember up above, I wrote uh, we're looking from 0 to 2 pi. So it uh, doesn't exist on these other parts. 
Now we're going to be plugging this into our um, second derivative, which is um, right here. Now, first thing to notice, save yourselves a little bit of work. Here we got cosine squared. Well, when you square anything, it's always positive. Here we got sine squared. When you square anything, it's always positive. And then times 2, it's still positive. So positive plus positive is positive. So we don't need to worry about the top part at all. The only part we need to plug it into is the bottom part. So um, let's pick our test cases. Something between 0 and pi over 2, like, I don't know, pi over 4. Something between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2, like pi. And something greater than 3 pi over 2, like um, 7 pi over 4. And again, we do not need to worry about the top part. It's always positive. We just need to plug it into the bottom part, which is cosine x to the third power. That's what that cosine third means there. Okay. This one, top part's positive. We just need to plug it in here. And uh, here again, top of the fraction is positive, so we just need to plug it into the denominator. Well, if I plug in pi over 4 here, I got cosine of pi over 4, which is square root of 2 over 2, if I look at my unit circle, which is positive. Positive number to the third power is positive. Positive divided by positive is positive. So this is concave up. Again, we could care less what the sign is, we're just or what the value is. We're just trying to figure out what the sign is. Now, if I put pi in, cosine of pi, if I look at my unit circle, uh, cosine, again, is your x part. Uh, we, that's equal to negative 1. Well, negative 1 to the third power is negative. Positive divided by negative is negative. So this is concave down. If I plug in 7 pi over 4, cosine of 7 pi over 4, if I look at my unit circle, is square root of 2 over 2. Um, which is positive. Positive third power is positive. Positive divided by positive is positive, which means this is concave up. So let's write down our answer then. <coughs> so for this problem, we're going to have concave up from 0 to pi over 2, concave down from pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2, and then concave up from 3 pi over 2 to 2 pi. And those are our answers. Let me save those. tablet to blow up, so let me bring up another copy. And let's look at our next problem. This one's different. It says find the uh, points of inflection and discuss the concavity of the graph. Be better if they just said find the points of inflection, because to find the points of inflection you have to actually find the concavity. So it's kind of given. So we've got f of x is equal to x to the third plus 9x squared plus 6x minus 12 and um, we're going to find the points of inflection. Now the points of inflection is where the concavity changes and um, so where it goes from concave up to concave down or vice versa uh, if we are looking at business applications, the uh, point of inflection is the point of diminishing returns. It's where you're, you should possibly start thinking about selling. Um, first step, find the second derivative. So first thing, um, our first derivative Take our power, put it out in front, so x to the third becomes 3x squared, plus, take our power, put it out in front, so we've got 9 times 2x, lower it by 1, plus 6. So that gives us 3x squared plus 18x 
plus 6. Now for our second derivative. Again, take your power, put it out in front. So we've got 3 times 2x plus, and then 18x becomes 18. And the 6 drops away. So that gives us 6x plus 18. Second step. Set this equal to 0. And solve. And again, this gives you your critical numbers. If we got a fraction, again, you want to set the top part equal to 0 and the bottom part equal to 0. So this one, we just got 6x plus 18. So we're set to 6x plus 18 equal to 0. Take the 18 over, it becomes a negative 18. And then divide both sides by 6, and we get x is equal to negative 3. Step, tr step 3, using the critical numbers, of course this at the time we just have 1, but using your critical numbers, build a table of intervals pick test cases plug into your second derivative and determine the concavity So let's do that. Then I'll put the note down about what is a point of inflection, even though we've talked about it. Okay, so we've got x is equal to negative 3. Clear over here is negative infinity. Clear over here is positive infinity. I want to pick test cases. I want to pick something between negative infinity and negative 3, like negative 4, negative 5. I want to pick something between negative 3 and infinity, like 0. And we want to plug those into our second derivative, which is 6x plus 18. <coughs> well, if I put negative uh, 4 in, 6 times negative 4 is negative 24 plus 18. Don't know what it is. Well, I could figure it out, but uh, it's negative, uh, which means it's concave down. And if I put 0 in, 6 times 0 is 0 plus 18, it's positive. Again, I could care less what the value is. I'm just trying to decide uh, what the concavity is. Okay, so the um, they're also they're asking us to identify uh, discuss the concavity. So let me write that down while I'm here. So it's concave down uh, from negative infinity to negative three, and then it's concave up from negative three to positive infinity. Now let me put down our note on the POI, point of inflection. And I won't write out the point of inflection, but um, we have a point of inflection, a POI, where the concavity changes, where the concavity changes, assuming That point exists in our original function. You can't have a point of inflection if the, if the graph doesn't even exist there. Well, if we look up here, we're dealing with a polynomial. Polynomial's uh, domain is negative infinity positive. They exist everywhere, so we're, we're fine there. Definitely the um, the um, concavity changes here, so which means we're going to have a POI at x is equal to negative 3. Now step 4. Plug this x value 
and I'll put an S on there to indicate you can have more than one, but plug this X value, we only got one here, plug this X value back into the original function, and find the Y value. Because we are talking about a point of inflection, so which means you got a point, uh, X and a Y. Well, our original function, uh, remember f of x is the same as y, is x to the third plus 9x squared plus 6x minus 12. So if we plug that in, we got negative 3 to the third plus 9 times negative 3 squared plus 6 times negative 3 minus 12. Negative 3 to the third is negative 27. Negative 3 squared is 9 times 9 is 81. 6 times negative 3 is negative 18 minus 12. <coughs> I probably regret not plugging this calculator. I'll probably make a basic math error here. Um, negative 18, negative 12 is negative uh, 30. And negative 27 is negative 57 plus 81. And uh, was that 24? So assuming no basic math error, uh, that's our y part. So our POI then, our x part we said was negative 3, and our y part is 24. So that's our point of inflection. Let me save that. Look at our next one. First one I did was kind of a trivial one. Um, I don't want to sit there and do just the easy ones, so we'll look at one with a radical. Those are always challenging. I guess I shouldn't say always, but most of the time they are. So let's take a look at this. We got f of x is equal to x times the square root of 4 plus x. And instructions say find the uh, points of inflection and discuss the concavity of the graph of the function. Well, first step, we need to find our second derivative. This um, f of x we can rewrite as x times 4 plus x to the 1 half power. This is product rule. Uh, this is p and this is q. So p prime, the derivative of x is 1. Q prime, the derivative of this, we got parentheses to a power, take your power, put it out in front. What's inside the parentheses remains as is. Lower your power by 1. 1 half minus 1 is negative 1 half. And then times the derivative of what's inside the parentheses, but derivative of 4 plus x is 1. Which means Q prime is going to equal to 1 over 2 times 4 plus x to the 1 half power. So our product rule is p prime q plus p q prime. So for our first derivative, p prime was 1 times q, which was 4 plus x to the 1 half power, plus p, which was x, times q prime, which is 1 over 2 times 4 plus x to the 1 half. Now we'd like this to be a, um, a single fraction, so I can put this uh, over 1. So we've got 4 plus x to the 1 half power over 1 plus x over 2 times 4 plus x to the 1 half. Now we need to get a common denominator, and um, let me continue up here. Since this one, uh, this denominator is a 1, then our common denominator will be the other one. So uh, I want to rewrite each of them with um, this denominator, 2 plus, or 2 times 4 plus x to the 1 half. Now 
Now our second fraction already had that, so it's fine. It stays as is. Our first one, we multiply the bottom part by 2 times 4 plus x to 1 halves so with multiply the top part by it. So we got uh, 4 plus x to the 1 half times 2 times 4 plus x to the 1 half. Now they have the same uh, denominator, so I'll go ahead and merge them into a single fraction here. We got 2 remains out in front. We got 4 plus x to the 1 half times 4 plus x to the 1 half. Since they're both 4 plus x to a power, we can add the exponents. So we got 4 plus x, 1 half plus 1 gives us um, 1. And then this plus x carries along over 2 times 4 plus x to the 1 half. Can't factor anything out here, so I'll get rid of parentheses, combine together like terms, see where I'm headed. 2 times 4 is 8. 2 times x is 2x plus x over 2 times 4 plus x to the 1 half. There. Now um, 2x plus x is 3x plus 8 over 2 times 4 plus x to the 1 half. Like that. And that's our first derivative. <coughs> I got a feeling I'm not going to be able to finish this all on one page here. So I'll get a piece of scratch paper and get it ready. There we go. grab a drink while I'm not doing that. Well, now I need to find my second derivative. And you can see finding the second derivative is not a trivial task. Well, a quotient rule. Let the top part be P and let the bottom part be Q. So P prime, the derivative of 3x plus 8 is 3. Q prime, 2 stays out in front. Here we got parentheses to a power, so we'll take our power, put it out in front. What's inside the parentheses remains as is, and we lower our power by 1. 1 half minus 1 is negative 1 half. And then chain rule, we'd multiply it times the derivative of what's inside the parentheses, but derivative of 4 plus x is 1. So that's just like times 1. Well, 2 times a half cancels. And as 4 plus x and negative 1 half, I'll take it down to the denominator. So this is 1 over 4 plus x to the positive one-half. Okay. We'll continue it over here. So our quotient rule is P prime Q minus P Q prime over Q squared. So for our second derivative, P prime we said was 3 times Q which is 2 times 4 plus x to the 1 half minus p, which was 3x plus 8, times q prime, which was uh, 1 over uh, 4 plus x to the 1 half power, all over q squared. And q was 2 times 4 plus x to the 1 half, all of that to the second power. Well, let's do a little bit of simplifying. 3 times 2 is 6. So we got 6 times 4 plus x to the 1 half minus, and I put the 3x plus 8 over the 4 plus x to the 1 half, all over. When everything inside of your parentheses or brackets is multiplication or division, and you're raising it to a power, you can take everything to that power. So I'll take 2 to the second power, which gives us 4. And I'll take the um, 4 plus x, the 1 half, to the second power. So 4 plus x to the 1 half to the second power. So I got um, 6 times 4 plus x to the 1 half minus 3x plus 8 over... 4 plus x to the 1 half, all over 4 times, when you raise an exponent to another exponent, you multiply the exponents, 1 half times 2 is 1, so that just leaves us uh, 4 plus x to the first power. Now I put the first power there for a specific reason, which we'll see in the next, next step. Now this is a um, complex fraction, a uh, fraction inside of a fraction.
specifically you could say it's a complex rational expression because it has x's, but it's a complex fraction. To get rid of a complex fraction, we multiply everything by the LCM of all our inner denominators. Now when I say inner denominators, I'm talking about the see this fraction is inside the other fraction. So the four plus x to one half is our inner denominator. And that's what we we'll multiply everything by. So um we got six four plus x to the one half, and we'll multiply that times four plus x to the one half minus three x plus eight over four plus x to the one half, and I'll multiply that times four plus x to the one half. And then down in our denominator, we got uh, 4 times 4 plus x to the first power. And we'll multiply it times 4 plus x to the 1 half. So you have to multiply everything by it. When I say everything, this is considered one group. This is a fraction. This is, uh, this is one group. Well, up on top, 4 plus x to the 1 half times 4 plus x to the 1 half. Since they're both 4 plus x, we can add the exponents. 1 half plus 1 half is 1. So that gives us 6 times 4 plus x to the first power. Now over here, this denominator will cancel with that. And that minus that's out in front has to affect everything that follows it. So we leave parentheses around to 3x plus 8. Down here, we got 4 plus x to the first power times 4 plus x to the 1 half. Since they're both 4 plus x, we're going to add the exponents. 1 plus 1 half gives us 3 halves. So we got 4 plus x to the 3 halves. Now, there's nothing to factor out of the top part, so I'm going to um, get rid of parentheses, combine together like terms, see where it heads. 6 times 4 is 24. 6 times x is 6x. Negative out in front of the parentheses flips the sign of everything, so it becomes a negative 3x minus 8, all over 4 times 4 plus x to the 3 halves. 6x minus 3x is 3x. 24 minus 8 gives us 16 over 4 times 4 plus x to the 3 halves. And that's our second derivative. Now let me write that one down because I'm at the very bottom of this page. So, second derivative. 3x plus 16 over 4 times 4 plus x to the 3 halves. You always kind of kind of hope on this um, that you didn't make a mistake. You know, somewhere right here, like you added something wrong. Because <laughs> at that point, it's, it's too late. Um, you, you might as well just redo it from scratch, not even look at your work. Um, to go through any race and try to fix it so is most times impossible. We'll run on the assumption I didn't make any basic math error, though. If I did, then, well, I'm human, so uh, don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. So, what problem is this? This is number 6 continued. Okay. 6 continued. Um, in our second derivative, actually, we write down our function first f of x was equal to x, square root of 4 plus x. Then our second derivative was equal to 3x plus 16 over 4 times 4 plus x to the 3 halves power. Okay, <coughs> that was step one. Step two, I uh, want to find our critical numbers. We'll set our top part equal to zero. So we'll set 3x plus 16 equal to 0, and we'll set our denominator equal to 0. So 4 times 4 plus x to the 3 halves equal to 0. Now here I got 3x is equal to negative 16, and then divide both sides by 3, and I get x is equal to negative 16 thirds. Now in this one, if you have parentheses to a power, and you have a number out in front, and you got 0 on this side, you can drop the number that's out in front, drop the exponent, and just set the what's inside the parentheses equal to 0. So we've got 4 plus x equal to 0, or x is equal to negative 4. 
Well, let's go back to our, um, our original uh, function. And let's talk about our domain. Whenever you have a radical with an even index, like a square root, the index is the number in the slot here, to find your domain, you always take what's underneath the radical, the 4 plus x, and you set it uh, greater than or equal to 0. We don't want it to be negative. It can be equal to 0. We just can't have a negative number inside of a radical with an even index. So I'll take the 4 over, and we get x is greater than or equal to negative 4. Why is this important? Look at um, this critical number here, negative 16 thirds. I don't know what that is uh, exactly decimal-wise or anything, but it's um, negative 5 and 1 third, which is not in our domain. So if you come up with any critical numbers that don't fit your domain, you have to cross them off. And this says uh, negative 4, which is actually where our domain begins, which is makes it kind of a boring problem. Um, kind of exciting up to that point, but um, we got x is equal to negative 4. And again, the graph doesn't exist over here. And then this one over here is positive infinity. So we just got one interval. Well, I pick a test case, something greater than negative 4, like 0. And I want to plug that into my second derivative, which is right here. Now, uh, let's talk about the 4 plus x to the 3 halves power. 4 plus x to the 3 halves. I could rewrite that. We got a property from intermediate algebra, algebra 2. It says you can take the number up on top, the 3, and put it on the outside of the parentheses. Like that. And 4 plus x to the 1 half power is the square root of 4 plus x. Now, f square root of um, 4 plus x I is always positive. And positive third power is still positive. And times the 4 that's out in front is still positive. So we don't need to worry about the bottom part. It's always positive. But let's look at the top part, 3x plus 16. Now, if you don't see this, it's no big deal. If you plug 0 in everywhere you have an x, you just see what your sign of it, sign of it is. But if I plug 0 in, 3 times 0 is 0, plus 16 is positive. Positive over positive is positive, which means this is concave up. So for concavity, this is concave up from negative 4 to infinity. There is no change in concavity, so there is no POIs. Let's graph this and see what it looks like. So press my y equals, clear. Then I'll do x square root, so we do second, x squared. 4 plus x, and then graph. Graph that actually kind of lies. We'll see that in a later section. How do you f find out the real graph? Because it, it doesn't look exactly like this. Uh, it actually comes up here and touches at the uh, x-axis at negative 4. But it looks like it just uh, doesn't. But obviously, when you look at it, it's concave up everywhere, which means there is no POIs. PO POIs is where the concavity changes. So again, on some of these problems, you can just look at it and, and see if what you got is reasonable. Let me save that. It's kind of a little bit of a challenging problem. I did that to offset the um, trivial one I did uh, for the first one for finding POI. Oops. And let's look at our next problem. Let me grab a drink here. Okay, so find the points of inflection. Same instruction. Along the way, we have to find the concavity. So we've got f of x is equal to 2 sine x uh, minus 2 cosine x. Now, first step, find our second derivative. So for our first derivative, we've got 2 carries down, derivative of sine is cosine, minus 2, and then derivative of cosine is negative sine, which gives us 2 cosine x, negative times negative is positive, so plus 2 sine x. So 
And for our second derivative, and I didn't put it here, but again, I do mean for um, x be between 0 and uh, 2 pi. Okay, for our second derivative, um, 2 carries down. Derivative of cosine is negative sine plus 2, and then derivative of sine is cosine. So that gives us negative 2 sine x plus 2 cosine x. Step 2. Set that equal to 0 and solve it. So we got negative 2 sine x plus 2 cosine x equal to 0. And there's two different ways I'm going to talk about uh, solving this. Uh, first one is um, I want to take the uh, negative 2 sine x to the right side. So we get 2 cosine x is equal to 2 sine x. And we can divide both sides by 2 and we get cosine x is equal to sine x. Okay, now here's where we veer off. I'll show you the first method. And then I'll also show you the second method over here. Second method is a lot easier if you're uh, comfortable with the unicircle. Uh, the first method here, uh, using some of our trig, um, we can score both sides. So I'll go ahead and score both sides. So that gives us cosine squared is equal to sine squared. Now I want these to be in terms of the same uh, trig function. So the cosine squared I can rewrite as 1 minus sine squared equals sine squared. Uh, I want to get everything with the sine squared on one side. So I take this negative sine squared over and we get 1 equals sine squared plus sine squared. <coughs> and that gives us 1 is equal to 2 sine squared. Divide both sides by 2, and we get 1 half is equal to sine squared. Now, from college algebra, if you got something squared equal to the other side, you drop your squared, and you put a plus or minus square root around the other side. And I'll flip these around. I'll put the sine over here. Well, we can't have a fraction inside of a square root, so I split it up, put a square root around top, square root around the bottom. Of course, square root of 1 drops away. And um, then we multiply top and bottom by square root of 2, and we get sine is equal to plus or minus square root of 2 over 2. Okay, so we, as we look around in our unit circle, we're looking wherever sine is equal to either a positive square root of 2 over 2 and, or a negative square root of 2 over 2, which is at uh, pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, and 7 pi over 4. Now, when you're solving trig equations in this manner, um, and you're, there's two things that make me check my answers. One of them is when you take both sides to a power. You always have to check your answers then, because you get the right answers, but s some of them, um, and then so some of them might be false. And the other thing is when you use trig identities to rewrite a, another trig function. You should always check it to be on the safe side. See up here where I rewrite cosine squared as 1 minus sine squared? Again, that right there triggers me after check my answers. Now, if I take these and plug them back into my original equation, the cosine x is equal to sine x up here, our answers, our critical numbers, I should say, will be pi over 4 and uh, 5 pi over 4. Okay. You can't always use this method, but sometimes it works very nice. By inspection, here we're saying cosine is equal to sine. Now cosine our unicircle is the x part, and sine is our y part. So basically we're going around the unicircle looking where the x and y are the same. And here at pi over 4, they're both square root of 2 over 2, like that. And then over here at 5 pi over 4. They're both negative square root of 2 over 2. So where the cosine is equal to the sine, the x is equal to the y on my points, is at these two places, which is what I just circled here. The inspection is a lot easier, but again, you can't always do every problem uh, like those with inspection. Okay, so we got those two as our critical numbers. 
So let's build our, uh, what is step is this? Step three, build our table of intervals. Now remember it starts at zero. And our pi over four is here. And our five pi over four is here. And then clear over here is going to be our two pi. Want to choose test cases between zero and pi over four, like pi over six. Choose something between pi over four and five pi over four. Um, pi pi over two pi. Let's say pi. Something uh, greater than five pi over four and less than two pi. Three pi over two. Like that. Now we want to plug those into our second derivative. What was our second derivative? Uh, negative 2 sine x plus 2 cosine x. So negative 2 sine x plus cosine x. Um, so I'm going to have negative 2 sine pi over 6 plus cosine pi over 6. Now if I look at pi over 6 on my unit circle, Pi over 6 is right here. We have uh, square root of 3 over 2 and 1 half. So um, sine, which is our y part, is 1 half. So negative 2 times 1 half is negative 1. Plus cosine of pi over 6 is square root of 3 over 2. Now square root of 3, I don't know what it is exactly, but it's 1 point um, something. Um, 1.4 or... 1.2, who knows? It doesn't matter. Um, I know it's 1 point something, which 1 point something over 2, that's like a half. Negative 1 plus a half is negative, um, which means this is concave down. Okay, now for pi, if I plug pi in, I got negative 2 sine x plus cosine x. And if I put pi in there, I got negative 2 sine pi plus cosine pi. Well, sine pi is um, 0, if I look at my unit circle. So negative 2 times 0 drops away. Cosine of pi is um, negative. Wait a minute. Um, yeah, it is negative. So... That would imply that's negative, which is concave down. I wonder if I screwed that up. Uh, if I put in 3 pi over 2, if I put in uh, to my negative 2 sine x plus cosine x, but put 3 pi over 2 in there, sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1 times a negative 2 is a positive 2. And cosine of 3 pi over 2 is 0, so that's positive, so this is concave up. Bothers me that this wasn't, um, let me double check this, negative 1 plus may not be as good at basic math as I think. Negative 1 plus square root of 3 divided by 2. Oops. Especially if I don't plug it in right in my calculator. Divided by 2. Enter. Negative concave down. Um, 0, pi over 4. Yeah. And then pi over 6 is uh, between 0 and pi over 4. If I plug in pi over 6, s um, sine is our y, which is 1 half, negative 1, and that's, hmm, I'm kind of wondering now, let me graph this and see. I don't want to continue on if I made a math error. I want to make sure I'm in radians, so I'll press mode, and you should see radians. If it isn't radians, it's like to down arrow to it and press enter on it. And, um, what do I got? 2 sine x, closing parentheses, minus 2 cosine x. And I'm going to do a zoom, and I'll choose uh, Z trig, number 7. Okay. So let's come down here. 0 to pi over 4. This is pi, pi over 2 here. So 0 to pi over 4. That's exactly in the middle there. OK. 
Okay. I think it's uh, I could buy that's concave down. And then from pi over 4 to 5 pi over 4. Uh, that's obviously concave down. And it changes. Okay, yeah, yeah, that looks very reasonable. It seemed weird when I got those results, kind of questioning myself. But um, So let me write down the con concavity. So this is concave down from 0 to pi over 4. And then it's concave down from pi over 4 to 5 pi over 4. And then it's concave up from uh, 5 pi over 4 to 2 pi. Okay. Well, the only place where the concavity changes is at 5 pi over 4. And um, sine and cosine are um, nice and continuous everywhere. There's no place where they're uh, not defined. Um, so we can go through and do step four. We got a POI at x is equal to 5 pi over 4. Remember our POI is where the concavity changes. It changes from concave down here to concave up. We want to plug that into our original function. So um, f of 5 pi over 4 is equal to 2 sine 5 pi over 4. I'm just plugging my original function. Minus 2 cosine 5 pi over 4. Now, um, I have to think about sine. For, okay. Sine of 5 pi over 4 is negative square root of 2 over 2 minus 2. And cosine of 5 pi over 4 is negative square root of 2 over 2. Well, these twos cancel, and we got negative square root of 2. These twos cancel, and a negative negative gives us a positive square root of 2, which gives us 0. So our POI, barely enough space for it, is uh, 5 pi over 4 and 0. So that's our POI. <coughs> Let me save that. Trig trig ones are always interesting. I, I like the trig problems. A lot of people don't, but Let's look at our next one. Got f of x is equal to e to the x squared minus 3x. Okay, same same steps. We want to find the uh, points of inflection. So our first step, um, we want to find our second derivative. So for our first derivative, the derivative of e to a power is e to the power. That doesn't change. But by the chain rule, you then have to multiply it times the derivative of the exponent. So again, whenever you have a um, uh, e to a power, the derivative of it is e to the power. It doesn't change times the derivative to the power. Well, the uh, derivative of x squared minus 3x is 2x minus 3. And e to the x squared minus 3x. And that's our first derivative. And we need to find our second derivative now. This will be the product rule. This will be p and this will be q. p prime, the derivative of 2x minus 3 is 2. And for q prime, the derivative of e to the x squared minus 3x is what we just found here, which is this. So it would be um, 2x minus 3 e to the x squared minus 3x. So product rule is p prime q plus p q prime. So for our second derivative, p prime was 2 times q, which is um, e to the x squared minus 3x, plus p, which was 2x minus 3, times q prime, which was uh, 2x minus 3, e to the x squared minus 3x. 
Okay, now let me double check that. Okay. prime times Q plus this times uh, yeah I guess so now um, notice on this they both have an e to the x squared minus 3x so I'll factor that out in front this leaves us a 2 and then this one leaves us 2x minus 3 times 2x minus 3 Now, um, nothing else I can factor out here, so um, I'll follow my typical way of solving these, which says get rid of parentheses, combine to get like terms, see what happens. But this one is special because you could go ahead and set this equal to zero and solve it and make the problem a lot simpler. Um, but let me pretend I don't see that. I do like... Uh, step by step that works 100% of the time or as close as we can get. So I'll multiply this together. Um, 2x times 2x gives us 4x squared. 2x times negative 3 is negative 6x. Negative 3 times 2x is negative 6x. Negative 3 times negative 3 is 9. Which gives us e to the x squared minus 3x. Combined together like terms. And we've got 4x squared. Negative 6x negative 6x is negative 12x. 2 plus 9 is 11. <coughs> okay. Well, now we're ready to um, uh, have step 1, I guess. Assuming I labeled it. Uh, yeah, I did. Step 2. We'll I'll find our critical numbers. So we're going to set each factor equal to 0. So I'll set e to the x squared minus 3x equal to 0. And I'll set 4x squared minus 12x plus 11 equal to 0. Now this is an exponential equation. Our, our steps for solving the exponential equation says get the part with the variable and the exponent by itself. No numbers in front of it, no numbers after it. Well, that's done. Uh, next step says to take natural log of both sides, take ln of both sides. But unfortunately, when I uh, take ln of both sides, we get natural log of 0, and you can't have um, a log of 0, which means there's no critical numbers that comes from that. Anytime you have a number, which e is just a number, it's 2.7 a bunch of decimal places. Anytime you have a number to a power equal to zero, that's never going to equal to zero. You can always cross it out. Now this one doesn't factor, so I have to use quadratic formula. So uh, a is the what's before x squared, which is four. B is what's before x, which is negative 12, and c is what's the number at the end, which is 11. Quadratic formula is negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So we've got negative, negative 12 plus or minus negative 12 squared minus 4 times a, which is 4, times uh, c, which is 11, all over 2 times 4. Well, negative, negative gives us a positive 12 plus or minus. Negative 12 squared is 144. Um, where's my calculator? 16 times 11. 16 times 11. 176. So we've got minus 176. You probably see the problem right here, over 8. 144 minus 176 is going to give us a negative number inside of a square root. We can't have that which means that this gives us no critical numbers. So we uh, found no critical numbers. Well, what does that mean? Well, if we go to step three, build our table of intervals based upon our critical numbers, there is none, so we're just going to go straight from negative infinity to positive infinity. And your test case is just choosing a value somewhere in there. Well, zero is probably a good one to choose. Now, if we come up to our second derivative, we've got e to the x squared minus 3x. e to the x squared minus 3x times 
4x squared minus 12x. 4x squared minus 12x uh, plus 11. Well, anytime you got e to a power, that's never going to be negative. So this first part's always positive. And if I don't see that, I could plug into 0. If I put 0 in for the x, I got 0 squared minus 3 times 0, which is 0. And e to the 0 is 1, so it's positive. Um, but any, again, anytime you have e to a power, you never need to worry about it. It's always positive. So we just need to worry about plugging in the 0 here. Um, well, if we put 0 in for the x here, 0 squared is 0 times 4 is 0. That drops away. If we put 0 here, that drops away. So we're left with a positive 11, which is positive, of course, um, which means it's concave up. Now, there's no change in concavity, so but we can tell about our... Um, or our, uh, actually, what is our concavity? So it's concave up from negative infinity to positive infinity. And there's no POIs, because we said there was no change of concavity. And those will be your answers. So let me save that. Let's look at our next problem. We'll grab a drink here. Hmm. Okay, so we got f of x is equal to arc cosine of x squared. Now this isn't one of them that we uh, run across a lot, so let me write down the formula here. The derivative of arc cosine u, where u represents anything. In this case, it's x squared. That's going to equal to negative u prime over the square root of 1 minus u squared. Well, for to use this formula, we need to know what a u is. And we said u is whatever's inside the parentheses, so u is equal to x squared. We need u prime for our formula. That's chain rule. Um, the derivative of x squared is 2x. So for our first derivative, we're just going to use our formula here. It's negative u prime. So we'll have negative 2x over the square root of 1 minus u squared. So u is x squared. So we got x squared squared, which gives us negative 2x. And I'm going to rewrite this uh, as the one-half power. So x squared raises the second power. When you're raising one exponent to another exponent, you multiply the exponents. So this gives us 1 minus x to the fourth, the one-half power. Okay, now we're ready for our second derivative. This will be the quotient rule. This will be p, and this will be q. p prime, the derivative of negative 2x is negative 2. For q prime, here we have parentheses to a power. Take our power, put it out in front. What's inside the parentheses remains as is. Lower our power by 1. 1, one half minus 1 gives us negative 1 half. Times the derivative of what's inside the parentheses. So q prime, we've got uh, 1 half, 1 minus x to the fourth to the negative 1 half, times uh, 1 drops away, and then derivative of negative x to the fourth is negative 4x to the third. So then q prime, 1 half times negative 4 is negative 2, so we've got negative 2x to the third. And the um, 1 minus x to the fourth to the negative 1 half, I'll take down to the denominator. And that's 1 minus x to the fourth to the positive 1 half. Now our quotient rule. Um, we got p prime q minus p q prime over q squared. 
So for our second derivative, p prime was um, negative 2 times q, which is uh, 1 minus x to the fourth to the 1 half power, minus p, which uh, p was negative 2x, um, times q prime, which was the uh, negative 2x to the third over 1 minus x to the fourth to the 1 half power, all over q squared. Uh, what was q? q was um, 1 minus x to the fourth to the 1 half, and again, that's squared. Uh, let me double check all that. p prime times q minus p times q prime. Okay, that looks good. Nasty, but looks good. Okay, so we got negative 2, 1 minus x to the fourth to the 1 half. <laughs> yeah, here we got a negative, negative, negative. Well, negative times negative is positive, times another negative is negative. And then uh, put these all up on top. 2 times 2 is 4. And x times x to the third is x to the fourth over 1 minus x to the fourth to the 1 half. All over. When you're raise, uh, raising one exponent to another exponent, you multiply the exponents. 1 half times 2 gives us 1. So this becomes 1 minus x to the fourth to the first power. Okay. Now we want to simplify this some more. This is a complex fraction, a fraction inside of a fraction. So we'll multiply everything by the LCM of all our inner denominators. We only have one inner denominator. I'll label it as ID here. Uh, this is our inner denominator. So we'll multiply everything by 1 minus x to the 4th to the 1 half power. So we've got negative 2, 1 minus x to the 4th to the 1 half times 1 minus x to the 4th to the 1 half minus 4x to the 4th over 1 minus x to the 4th to the 1 half times 1 minus x to the 4th to the 1 half all over 1 minus x to the 4th to the first times 1 minus x to the 4th to the 1 half. Well, the negative 2 carries down here. We have 1 minus x to the 4th to the 1 half times 1 minus x to the 4th to the 1 half. Since these are both 1, mi one minus x to the 4th to a power, I can add the exponents. So that gives me 1 minus x to the 4th to the first power. Now over here, this 1 minus x to the 4th, <laughs> 1 minus x to the 4th to 1 half cancels with this one. So we got uh, minus 4x to the 4th over 1 minus x to the 4th. Now since these are both 1 minus x to the 4th, I add the exponents, which gives me 3 halves. Okay. Which gives us um, nothing I can factor out here, so I'll go ahead and multiply it through, combine and get a like term, so forth. Negative 2 times 1 is negative 2. Negative 2 times negative x to the 4th gives me a positive 2x to the 4th minus 4x to the 4th over 1 minus x to the 4th to the 3 halves. Well, um, it gives us negative 2 uh, minus 2x to the 4th over this. And that was step, um, step 2, I guess. That's our second derivative. Or step 1, I guess. <laughs> Still on step 1. I'm only dreaming that I, I'm on step 2. Okay. So that was step 1. Well, now we go to step 2. And um, I know this flow is kind of kind of weird. Step 2. We want to find our critical numbers. So set our, to set our top part equal to 0. Minus 2 minus 2x to the 4th equal to 0. And I'll set the bottom part equal to 0. So 1 minus x to the 4th to the 3 halves equal to 0. 
Now in this one, um, I'll take the negative 2x to the fourth right side. So we've got negative 2 is equal to positive 2x to the fourth. Divide both sides by 2, and I get negative 1 is equal to x to the fourth. Now, whenever you take something to an even power, it can never equal to a negative number. So I know I don't need to worry about that. There's no critical numbers coming from that. This one over here. If you got uh, parentheses to a power equal to 0, again, you can take what's inside the parentheses and set it equal to 0. So 1 minus x to the fourth is equal to 0. Take the x to the fourth over. becomes that. And I'll rewrite it um, in this manner. Now, x to the fourth, that's like x to the four over one power equals one. And to get rid of the exponent, we're going to take both sides to a power equal to the reciprocal of that. So we'll take both sides to the one fourth power. Now, whenever you have an even number up on top here, that's when you put a plus or minus on the other side. And those fours cancel, the ones cancel, we got x. And 1 to any power is 1, so we got x is equal to plus or minus 1. <coughs> Getting a drink. So those are our critical numbers. Now, um... If we think about our uh, domain for arc cosine, arc cosine is um, valid from 0 to pi. Uh, that, those are the values we can have. Um, now, pi is like 3, uh, approximately. Um, when we come up with um, x is equal to 1 and x is equal to negative 1, you might be looking at that thinking, okay, well, that's not in your domain. But uh, realize that what we have here is an x squared. So uh, those are, are possible to have. Um, if I think about this being squared, right, let me demonstrate it. Okay, so I'm in radians, I believe. And for arc cosine, that's the same as inverse cosine here. Um, and if I put in 0, we get this. And then if I put in um, I put in pi, you get an error. See, it doesn't, uh, doesn't exist at pi. Um... This is going from 0. And then we take what's inside here, the x squared, and then that's less than that. Now, I could um, take the square root of everything, and um, then we get 0 is less than or equal to x is less than um, the square root of pi. Because if I put that in there, um, then the uh, square root of pi gives us, the second power gives us pi. Um, so this is what we're really looking at, where uh, the x's can be between. Okay. Well, I, I shouldn't say the... Um, I'm all messed up. <laughs> Better go back to bed. <laughs> Forget that. That's going to become important for our, um, our side part, but that's not what I'm trying to indicate here. Uh, when I pl plug in negative 1 and 1, both of those are okay. Um, like if I plug in arc cosine, ah, arc cosine of 1 squared, we get a value. If I plug in arc cosine of negative 1 squared, so we get a value. So both of those work. So let's come down here then. And we came up with x is equal to negative 1. And we came up with um, x is equal to 1.
Now, if I um, if I try to plug in, uh, for example, um, two squared, see that we get an error. So we have to think about our outer, uh, think about our outer um, outer limits on that. <coughs> well, uh, zero is obviously in the middle, so that's okay. But our highest value is um, pi. Um, and then, if I come over here, we got x is equal to pi. Actually, it's not pi. What is it? Square root of pi. Um, so we got x is equal to the square root of pi. Over on this side, we got x is equal to negative square root of pi. Now we know it can't include those values. Um, and it can't be less than that, can't be greater than that. I demonstrated that by putting 2 squared in there. But if you put this squared in there, again, that gives you an error. But then if you put anything less, it's okay. So it's, it's a little bit weird to think about your domain uh, setting up these, these boundaries right here. Now, um, I don't know what square root of pi is. Let's see. Um, square root of pi. 1.8, 1 approximately. So I want this is negative 1.8. So I want to choose something between negative 1 and negative 1.8. So negative 1.1. Uh, choose something between negative 1 and 1, like 0. And choose something between 1 and and 1.8. Uh, uh, so like 1.1. 1 .1. So those would be good ones. And we want to plug those into our second derivative, which is right here. Now, we already said that the 3 halves power, I could rewrite this, and this is always positive. So we just need to plug it in the top part. The bottom is always positive. So we've got negative 2 minus 2x to the fourth. Negative 2 minus 2x to the fourth. That's positive. And negative 2 minus 2x to the fourth. That's positive. Well, if I put in 0, I'll start with the easy one. 0 to the fourth is 0 times negative 2 is 0. Minus 2 minus 0 is negative. Divide by positive is negative. So this is concave down. Now if I put in 1.1. Uh, 1 .1. Minus 2 minus 2 times 1.1 1 .1 to the 4th power. That's negative. This is I didn't expect that, but it's negative. Negative over positive. It's negative, so it's concave down. And this would also be concave down. So what does this graph look like then? Arc cosine of x squared. Okay, so second cosine of x squared. And I'll do a zoom and choose z trig. Well, sure enough, it's uh, concave down everywhere, isn't it? Um, which means there's no POIs. So this is, um, let's see if I got room here. This is concave down from uh, negative square root, square root of pi to negative 1. Negative 1 to 1 and 1 to square root of and there's no POIs. Now, myself, I have to really think about these myself when I'm working these um, arc cosine, arc sine, arc tangent. Because it, it throws you, when you have more than a single x in here, you have to really do some thinking about what that, what that means. Now, uh, initially I was wrong when I was trying to take square root of everything. <laughs> Because the zero doesn't actually matter. This is our high end, and that's why it mattered when you got the x squared. So let me save that. It seems like I've been creating this video forever. There we go. When did I start? Seven o'clock. About an hour, 40 minutes ago. Okay. Let's ta take a look at the second derivative test.
I'm only going to show one problem with this. I I'm not really crazy about second derivative tests, and I'll explain why when I work the problem. Uh, it says, let f be a function such that f prime of c is equal to 0, and the second derivative of f exists on an open interval containing c. If f double prime of c is less is greater than 0, then f of c is a relative min. If f double prime of c is less than 0, then f of c is a relative max. If f double prime of c is equal to 0, the test fails. So let's uh, work this problem and see what these steps mean. So we got f of x is equal to 1 third x to the third minus 7 halves x squared plus 10x plus 2. And the instructions here say find all relative extrema. Use the second derivative test where applicable. So second derivative test. And I'm not going to write down uh, everything on this. But our first step is to find the first derivative. Why, why do I say that? Well, that's what this is saying right here. You know, once you get, if you go and majoring in math, you should get used to reading this notation. This f prime of c, well, that f prime says, hey, first find your first derivative. Then set it equal to zero and solve it and get your critical numbers. And the c's will represent your critical numbers. So that's what they're telling us. So we'll find our first derivative. Again, numbers out in front, stay out in front. So take your power, put it out in front, lower it by one. Minus 7 halves times, take your power, put it out in front, lower it by 1. And 10x just becomes 10. 1 third times 3 cancels. We got x squared. These 2's cancel. So we got minus 7x plus 10. Step 2. Set this equal to 0. And solve. And again, these are going to give us our critical numbers. So those will give us our critical numbers. So we got the x squared minus 7x plus 10 equal to 0. And this factors as x minus 2 times x minus 5 using the PSD method. Uh, zero factor property, you get zero on one side, you factor the other side, you set each factor equal to zero. So I got x minus 2 is equal to zero, and x minus 5 equal to zero. Take the negative 2 over, it becomes a positive 2, and take negative 5 over, it becomes a positive 5. So these are our critical numbers. According to the definition, those are our C's. That's what this first part says such that f prime of c is equal to 0. And uh, again, the beauty of math is a short notation here tells you exactly uh, what to do with very few words. Now this part down here says if f double prime of c, well, what that's saying is to um, find your second derivative. That's step 3. So find second derivative. Well, remember our first derivative was right here. So for our second derivative, the x squared becomes 2x minus 7x, so minus 7, and then 10 drops away. So we got our second derivative. Then step 4, plug in the critical numbers and use a table. Okay, so we got our first critical number, x equals 2, and our second one, x is equal to 5. So if I put those in, um, f double prime of 2 is equal to 2 times 2 minus 7. Put them in my second derivative. 4 minus 7 is negative 3. And put 5 in. I got f double prime of 5 is equal to 2 times 5 minus 7. 10 minus 7 gives us a positive 3. Okay. 
our table over here. It says if uh, after you plug in the value, that's what this says, f double prime of c says plug in your c's, your critical numbers, if it's greater than 0. Well, this one is greater than 0. So this one is greater than 0. Which this one then tells me if it's greater than 0, then, uh, then it's a relative min. So we're going to have a relative min at x is equal to 5. Now our second one. If f double prime of c is less than 0, well, this is negative 3. This is less than 0. That says if it's less than 0, then we got a relative max. So we got a relative max at x is equal to 2. Okay. Um, find the y values from the original function. Because remember, our, our relative min and relative max um, uh, are points. So we have to plug those back into our original function. Where was our original function? Ooh, yuck. Um, so we're going to have y is equal to 1 third times 2 to the third minus 7 halves times uh, 2 squared plus 10 times 2 plus, plus 2. Okay, 2 to the third is 8 times 1 third is 8 thirds minus 2 squared is 4. Um, cancel simplifies with this. That gives us minus 14. Uh, 10 times 2 is 20 plus 2 which gives us 8 thirds. Uh, 20 minus 14 is 6 plus 2 is 8. 8 times 3 is 24 plus 8 is um, 24 brain shutting down. 32. So that's 32 over 3. Assuming I did my basic math right, which is questionable. 24. Yeah, 32. Okay, so our relative max is going to be at uh, x was 2, and then our y was 32 over 3. So that's our answer there. Now here, we're going to plug into 5. So we've got y is equal to 1 third times 5 to the third minus 7 halves times 5 squared plus 10 times 5 plus 2. 5 to the third is 125, so we got 125 over 3 uh, minus uh, 5 squared is 25 times 7 is 175 over 2. Uh, yeah, that's right. Plus 10 times 5 is 50 uh, plus 2. And I don't want to think that hard, so let me use my calculator. Let's see, 125 divided by 3 minus 175 divided by 2 plus 52. Enter, and then I'll do math. Enter, enter. Oh, that's nice. 37 over 6. Assuming I typed it in correctly. That's always a big if. Uh, looks right. So we're going to have a relative min at 5 and 37 over 6. Well, you're looking at this and you think, okay, well, that's, that's not too difficult. Uh, let me save that, actually, before I forget. I have done that before. I uh, never really emphasize this too much. And uh, the reason why is it works pretty pretty good with uh, polynomials, uh, where your second derivative is easy to find. As we've seen in this video, sometimes that second derivative is as hideous as can be to find. So to make us go through and find the second derivative so we then plug in the critical numbers from our first derivative, um, yeah, that doesn't always uh, go over very well. 
Um, I'd much rather just find the first derivative and build our table of intervals and plug in our test cases. And then the second reason why I don't, I'm not crazy about it is look at number three. If it's equal to zero, the test fails. So it doesn't work all the time, and you have to go back and use the uh, the first derivative test anyway. Uh, what well we did uh, when we found a relative min, relative max in the previous lesson. Um, so again, that's the second derivative test. I kind of satisfied uh, showing that to you, but um, best place is again when you're working with polynomials for that. Okay, let me stop the recorders. Oh, almost two hours work for um, some kind of movie studio uh, creating these. <laughs> I'm sure people would pay a lot of money for it. Nothing more exciting than this. Much better than watching Star Wars or something. Uh, let me see. F10.